Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Glittering Bell Jar. I'm Brie. And I'm Valerie. And we are back for another episode, episode seven, to talk about the Deathly Hallows. So if you are new here, what we do is we start backwards. We started all the way at the epilogue, and we are working our way from the back of the book to the front. So this episode, we are going to be covering uh, chapter 22, 23, or 21, excuse me, and 20. Yep. And this is literally the Deathly Hallows section of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Uh, It's very interesting. I was really excited how quickly we moved into this section because we've been talking about the Deathly Hallows since they're obviously important to the end of the book. And now we finally get all of the story and mythology behind them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was a good couple chapters, but I feel like we covered so much the last episode that... Yeah, maybe it was a little less a little less exciting than I thought, but I still feel like we're going to pick up some good stuff on this episode. Oh, I have so many notes. This, <laughs> is, this is definitely like the the meat of it for me because it's it's Perfect. basically like two <laughs> two chapters all about the Deathly Hallows and one that's like a transitioning travel chapter. But we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Okay. So first off, though, how are you, Brie? Oh, um, I am good. It's been snowing this past weekend, but we went and hung out with my niece, and we had like a snow day and celebrated her birthday. It was loads of fun. How are you? Oh, that's nice. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. It's snowing here too. Um, it is very winter. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, we're just kind of taking it easy, trying to keep our driveway clear and enjoying <laughs> the nice winter scene outside. So I don't know if we've told everyone yet. So I live in Durham, North Carolina. And do you care to tell everyone where you live? Sure. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. So nice. yeah, up near the lake, very mm-hmm. the, the edge of the frozen north. <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't know, we're both uh, West Coast girls. We both lived in Seattle for a bit and we're obsessed with it. Um, but the lack of sun and the wanting to be able to afford where we live forced us away from the beautiful West Coast. Mm-hmm. For now. Yeah. For now. For we now. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we'll definitely both okay. be back one day. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into the Wizarding World. Um, Just as a reminder to everyone, the way we read it is that um, we start with the last sentence and then we read the chapter. So in the podcast episode, Brie will give us a synopsis and then I will read the last sentence of the chapter. Yep. All right. Chapter 22, The Deathly Hallows. So the big three have just escaped Xenophilus Lovegood's house after he tricked them into staying and calling, calling the Death Eaters. After learning about the Deathly Hallows, Harry becomes obsessed with the idea of them and that they are the key to beating Voldemort. Hermione and Ron are insistent that they should keep looking for Horcruxes. At the end of the chapter, they are able to tune into Potter Watch, which pulls them out of their obsessions a little bit. However, Harry says the name Voldemort, which triggers the charm and people arrive to capture him. Them. Yep. Yep. And the last sentence of this chapter is... We know you're in there. You've got half a dozen wands pointed at you, and we don't care who we curse. <laughs> There's actually two sentences, but I figured we needed more than one sentence to make sense of the end. So we're ending right as the Snatchers arrive to take mm-hmm. them away to Malfoy Manor, which is what we covered in the last episode. And we're going to mm-hmm. move backwards now to the... It's actually a series of about three months between when they learn about the Deathly Hallows and when they wow. are captured. Um, I did some timeline tracking in this set of chapters. So... Really? This one chapter, yeah, this one chapter covers three months. It doesn't wow. seem like that, but that is what happens. And uh, it's very much in line with earlier parts of Deathly Hallows that we haven't covered yet, where the group is just moving around the country, trying to stay hidden, trying to figure out what to do, though that now they have a little bit more of an inkling of what the two options before them are. So mm-hmm. let's see. Do you have any notes on this chapter? Um, I do. Um, why don't you go ahead? Cool. Uh, yeah. Sure, I can do that. So I, let's see, do I want to jump around? I don't want to jump around because I think there's <laughs> some important stuff and I think we'll get to it as we move through the chapter in reading order. But right off the bat, I wanted to start out with the discussion of Luna and where Luna is being held prisoner. Yes. So we know that she's actually at Malfoy Manor, but yeah. in this chapter, Hermione, Ron, and Harry are discussing whether or not she might be at Azkaban and how she might be doing because they've just learned that she's not at home. She's been taken captive. Yes. And I love Harry's defense of her. She's tough, Luna, much tougher than she much tougher than you'd think. She's probably teaching all the inmates about Raxperts and Nargles. Which yes. is just, yep, that's probably exactly <laughs> what she would be doing. 
<laughs> yeah, that is what I also had written down. That's actually one of the first things I have, which is so fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, I I love this. I cannot like each chapter. Like I feel like we keep getting, and I don't. It won't always be like this, I imagine. But we keep getting little snippets of Luna and how strong Harry and Luna's friendship really was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's maybe in one of the um, other chapters that we're going to cover today. But to cheer Harry up, Ron is even like, hey, Luna will probably be there. You know, like mm -hmm. he even knows how much Harry like, you know, has a close relationship with Luna, even though they just accept her kind of uh, different personality, you know, kind of off the wall personality. Yeah, it's actually, I'm very much looking forward to getting into the other books where there are mm -hmm. meaningful interactions between Harry and Luna, because I think they're going to make more sense of this connection that the two of them have that I never really paid much attention to. Um, yeah. I mean, she's she has identified him as one of the five friends that she has in life. That I we, know. We're going, to, we're going to talk about that in, <laughs> yeah. when we get to that chapter today. Um, that is, obviously, Harry's important to Luna, but it's clear, too, that Luna is important to Harry. And he has a lot yeah. of confidence and faith in her, even though a lot of people underestimate her or misunderstand her, which is yeah. very cool. Yep. And then did you see, so speaking of Luna, Luna versus Hermione, um, I'm probably going to butcher the name, but it's the... A rumpnet horn, not a crumple horn snorak. So they mm -hmm. actually, so it, it goes back to that. So you get to see that we talked about it in, um, I believe, the chapter after Shell Cottage, where Luna and Hermione are arguing about the um, the crumple horn snorak, um, mm -hmm. and you get an, you start to see where that began, where you actually mm -hmm. see Hermione pointing that out immediately. Um, you see the yeah, it it's really interesting because. Um, in this chapter and in chapter 21, which we'll cover next, um, first Xenophilia says it and then Harry remembers it that Hermione is quite close-minded to anything that she doesn't understand. Yes. Um, and it's interesting that that's the case considering she lives in a world with magic. She yeah. was a child who didn't have any magic and was brought into a world with magic and yet she still doesn't necessarily believe that mm -hmm. things can exist which don't make sense or that she doesn't know about, that she can't <laughs> verify, which sort of goes against the, the natural yeah. state of like, you were you didn't know about magic and now you do so obviously there are things you don't know about in the world um yeah. though i will say remembering back when they talked to xenophilius lovegood it's like well of course you don't trust this guy he's he's a nut like yeah <laughs> he's been out there and he now looks like a disheveled man losing his mind of course you're not going to necessarily give what he says a lot of credence but this chapter the deathly this one's called the deathly hallows yeah. this is the one where it all makes sense to harry and i yeah. agree now having reread it more closely and independent of the narrative of reading the book in order mm -hmm. it all makes sense this yeah. is the chapter where harry's right 100 percent. and when remus says that to them over, through the radio later in the episode it's like Harry's right. And we all know Harry's right. Um, everything <laughs> yeah. fits together here. And I love that it fits together so well, because I think books of this magnitude and this size of the universe that they're living in often stumble at this point in their story. So we're at the end, we're moving toward the end of the seventh book in a series. A lot of series struggle to like make it all make sense. This mm -hmm. makes perfect sense to the reader because it makes perfect sense to Harry and all the pieces we needed were given to us. Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, I think I, I tried, I butchered it in one of our earlier episodes. Um, there's no, you know, band-aid or last minute information being dropped mm -hmm. in to try and make sense of it. Uh, do sex machina is what it's called. I can never think Ooh. of that right off the top of my head. It's a film term where you introduce a last minute element or character that like solves the major problem. Mm -hmm. This doesn't do that. It, and that's right. why it's so satisfying. Right. Yeah. There are clues sprinkled throughout the entire series, which is mm -hmm. yes. So very satisfying. Right. We um, know that we know about the cloak. We've already seen the mm -hmm. stone. And in this one and these chapters, they discuss more about the Elder Wand, which is something I'm sure yep. we're going to come back to. We discussed it last episode. We're discussing it again because it is such an interesting and important magical object. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know what I liked about this chapter, though, was I feel like it kind of took us out of and I imagine the next following chapters, we're going to be very much stuck in Hermione, Ron and Harry world where this chapter kind of separates us a little bit and you could tell it kind of took the other characters out of it as well. They're able to get out of their own head um, whenever they listen to Potter watch and um, they, yeah, I don't know. I just liked that they were able to start thinking about other people. Cause when they're talking about Luna, it made me think like, wow, there really is this whole war going on and people are good people or good wizards are being put into Azkaban. And you're like, 
I, I mean, I'm sure that we could Google it and we could find out, but I, it is curious to think like, wow, who all got put into Azkaban? How mm -hmm. were they doing? Did they go crazy? Did they survive? You know? Um, mm -hmm. And it is, I don't know if it's because it's just um, convenient or if our main characters, all of them, all the big main characters and even the little side characters we see, pretty much none of them went to Azkaban. You know, you didn't, Hagrid was managed to escape, which before he wasn't able to, you know, everyone in the Order of the Phoenix, Kingsley managed to escape. I found that all interesting. It's slightly convenient, but uh, that none of them got captured. But again, we mm -hmm. could attribute that to the fact that they're just all very full, powerful witches and wizards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is pretty interesting that no one ends up in Azkaban that we know about and that we don't really, through the, 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 the storytelling device and the way the book is written, we don't really get a sense of what's happening to other people. Like mm -hmm. to draw an analogy, Game of Thrones does the opposite where you mm -hmm. know every single character at, at the same time. Like he writes that series. So you always know where every character is by like, doing chapters about each character mm -hmm. this book doesn't do this the series doesn't do it because things are happening behind the scenes and you have to like be reminded of them as a reader to remember what all these other characters are doing and I think we kind of saw that too in Gringotts which we did a couple episodes ago where yep. as soon as the the main group and and the the narration takes us out of the main hall of Gringotts into the tunnels underground things are going on up in that main hall when they call the Death Eaters and that's how yeah you know, like that's how they get caught and then they have to write out on the dragon. So this, this one is again, a good reminder that there are always other things happening behind the scenes and you should be paying attention to that and trying to remember where those characters are because they come back later or earlier in the book and it's important. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what else did you find? Okay. So the most important thing that I found that I had mm. never, ever understood, and I'm sure people have caught this and it just wasn't me, is that Harry and Voldemort are related. Yes. Yes. I saw that too. And I was like, wait, does that mean? Yep. That's exactly what it means. Because if Marvolo Gaunt is a descendant of, I think it's Cadius, mm -hmm. the middle brother, the one with the right. resurrection stone. Yeah. And Harry is a descendant of Ignotus, the youngest mm -hmm. brother with the cloak. That means if you go far enough back, they are actually related. Um, yeah. which I don't know why that wasn't drawn, drawn out. Like why Harry didn't make that connection when he's like, I'm related to the Peverils too. And that means that I'm related to Voldemort. Holy crow. Like he's my eight, you know, cousin, great, great, great cousin, 18 times removed or something like that. And I'd love to see if anyone has done it, a family tree. I'm sure oh. some people have kind of like elaborated the middle, but it's clear that they have to be related. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. So I didn't write that down, but I, as I was reading, I was like, "Oh, I need to Google that," and then I just completely forgot. So I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I also was like, "Wait, if that's if Marvel is his gone to his," I'm like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> like, are they actually mm -hmm. related?" That is weird. I guess is the best way, like spooky. <laughs> yeah. So according to this, um, I found one just now, really quickly from MuggleNet, okay. which I think is fairly trustworthy source. Yeah. Um, they, they did do a family tree. I'm having a really hard time actually getting to the file. Um, yeah, thanks okay. a lot, Google. Um, but yeah, they <laughs> are... Oh, it's Cadmus. Excuse me, not Cadius. Cadmus. Mm, um, okay. I can't even really see this image. It's so small, which is the problem. But also suggests that Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignotus are the Peveril brothers that yes. somehow... Um, sorry, I'm doing this. I'm trying to understand that Salazar Slytherin is a descendant of... Cadmus as well. Oh, because remember, well, right, because, Voldemort says he's yes. related to Slytherin. Mm -hmm. So that's how far back. Like if if it's a thousand wow. years back to the founding of Hogwarts, the the Peveril brothers are even before that. Wow. Well, yeah, no wonder it's a tale. Yeah, I mean, no wonder if it's turned into a children's tale. Right, like a myth, like a thing that people don't even remember. What is it in the beginning of Lord of the Rings? Um, you know, stories became legends, legends became myths, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the way that stories are passed down over thousands of years, which is basically the timeline we're talking about. So you go far enough back and Voldemort and Harry are related. Mm. Wild. Kind of love yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes, yeah. It, it brings a little bit of symmetry or like mm -hmm. um, consensus to like these two are connected mm -hmm. because they're actually related. And I don't know that that, you know, obviously you would have had to have a whole other backstory for that to be Neville, right? And maybe yeah. that's part of why Voldemort did also was drawn mm -hmm. to Harry as the target of his 
ire and his in, in interpreting the prophecy is because there is some sort of magic connection between them. And it's that they are part of it's that they are related. Well, and what I love even more is that Harry is technically related to the youngest who was the wisest. So mm -hmm. he was the one who wanted the cloak to just be able to outsmart just once he wanted to die, he was old. He's like, okay, now death and I are going to walk away as equals where the other ones, you know, the oldest, the eldest wanted to master, he wanted to be the master of death as far as like killing. Um, and then the resurrection stone where Voldemort kind of is always looking back. He's always very mad about his past and where he came from. And you could say that's similar to the resurrection stone. The fact he, that yeah. he couldn't look forward. He always was looking he, back. He does carry his demons around with him. He never yeah. lets them go. When, yeah. as we've discussed, that is one of the many reasons that he's defeated is because he doesn't l learn to to reckon with his past and let it go and move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, getting good stuff right now. I'm digging mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, I told you, I got a lot of good stuff out of this one. Um, another interesting thing that I caught was that, uh, you know, so beginning of the chapter, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are discussing Hallows versus Horcruxes. And then Harry sort of concedes, like, let's focus on Horcruxes because Hermione and Ron don't really believe in the Hallows. And they mm -hmm. list off a bunch of places that might be locations for Horcruxes, including Diagon Alley, Hogwarts, the Riddle House, Borgen and Burks, and Albania, which actually is where one of the Horcruxes was stored. Oh, yeah. The because diadem. that's where the diadem was. So mm -hmm. actually... That is a that is a correct place to go search, though, of course, I think they discussed it at another point in this book. Like, how do you go search an entire country in the forests of Albania? Like, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't practical, which is thankfully why the diadem was not there. But yeah, Albania was a correct guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, something I noticed, which has to do with um, like their good guesses and their wit. I think one of Harry's main superpowers one of his, he has a bright mind. And I know we talk about Hermione having a bright mind, but I keep thinking as I'm reading from the back forward is, man, Harry just keeps getting lucky. He's not lucky. He pays attention. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in this chapter, I can't remember exactly what it is, but he he has a memory going back to um, whenever he was looking into the pensive and he saw, I can't remember now, but he saw something and he's like, oh, that's where I saw the Deathly Hallows or that's where I saw the Horcrux. Like he he just keeps remembering. He has a very, mm -hmm. very sharp memory and he is always paying attention around him. And I think mm -hmm. that is another one of the reasons that they're able in the end to defeat Voldemort is because of that. And I kept thinking it was luck. I'm like, oh yeah, Harry just suddenly remembered the diadem in the room of requirement. And it's like, no, he didn't suddenly. He has a really sharp mind. Yeah. And he has a good intuition. His intuition, mm -hmm. as Remus says, is often correct. Yeah. Um, very, very often correct. And oh, that yeah. I think is important is that when he remembers and connects dots, he's usually right about that. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's able to succeed is because those two things together in the grand way of storytelling, where you're solving a puzzle, where you're mm -hmm. on a quest, those kinds of uh, personality traits or intellectual traits are very important for solving pro puzzles and problems. Yeah. And if you don't know what we're talking about, whenever they're um, on Potter Watch, um, Remus ends up coming on and talking and him and Harry had had a big fight before. And one of the last things he says on the show is basically to uh, follow your intuition, follow mm -hmm. your gut, which I believe I tell that him had to something follow his instincts, which are mm -hmm. good and nearly always right. Yeah. Which I believe had something to do with their fight. I honestly don't remember. So I'm sure we'll find out, which will be fun to discover. Well, if I remember the fight correctly, it was, it was Harry telling Remus, you need to go back to Tonks. You're not going to go travel with us gallivanting around when you're responsible for having a child. That's what you need to be doing. And so Lupin has now gone back and mm. is probably acknowledged that Harry was right, that he did need to be with Tonks and his new family. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. But also Harry's often right. that His instincts are very good. So <laughs> yes. That's good true. advice in general. Yeah. Uh, what about, so I... I paid attention to the cloak a little bit in this chapter as well. I'm still very enamored by the Deathly Hallows. And now my focus is mm -hmm. on the cloak. So we've been talking about this the entire, um, so far, all of our episodes, I almost said seasons, all of our episodes have been, um, we're confusing episodes and chapters every time. So all of our uh, episodes have been on, um, we've talked about the cloak and trying to figure out exactly what is it impervious to. Um, and so um, we learn with the Deathly Hallows that the cloak 
it's supposed to be like no matter what curses are thrown out of it thrown at it mm -hmm. it's supposed to repel them but there's a couple theories and i want to keep watching because even on um like harry wiki there's still some contradictory stuff and i don't know if they're just plot holes or if we can maybe summon something out of it but the theory is that you can throw a curse out of it but if you know where the person is because in the actual whenever Harry and Vold uh, Dumbledore are talking, he says Voldemort knew where my parents were, so it wouldn't have protected them. So there's a theory that if you know exactly where the wearer of the cloak is, you can throw a curse at them, not at the cloak. So if you try to do like Accio, Accio, sorry, Accio to pull the cloak off, it's not going to work because the cloak itself is impervious to curses. But if you know where the wearer is, you can then throw a curse at it. Hmm. So that's another, because if you think about the... Um, Whenever they're at the tower, right before Dumbledore dies, he does throws a charm at Harry, but it isn't a wand; it's a word. He uses it with he uses words to stun him, so that he's not able mm -hmm. to come up and with him to the top of the tower with Malfoy. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm just one more like layer of the cloak I'm trying to understand, and the only thing I can think of is yeah that because Voldemort knew where they were, that's why the cloak wouldn't have saved James and Lily that night in Godric Hollow. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually, now that you mm -hmm. say the, the cloak is super important and we're going to be paying attention to it mm -hmm. um, because you're right. I believe Harry is under the cloak and yet mm -hmm. Dumbledore is able to cast a spell on him. And mm -hmm. in, is it not a Goblet of Fire, maybe? Whenever Malfoy, he hears his, he hear, someone hits Harry's head with the trunk. And he says, like, ow. And so Malfoy knows that Harry's been eavesdropping on them in the train, the Hogwarts mm -hmm. Express, and he stuns them, stuns him. Mm -hmm. Or did he pull mm. the cloak off? I don't know. I need to read the exact text. So mm -hmm. again, that can be something we can discover as we go. But anyways, I am just super, yeah, I'm enamored by this cloak, trying to figure out exactly what its magic is and if it was all thought out or if you know, she kind of made it up as she went and we're just... Yeah, because those are bottles. some inconsistencies in the way the cloak behaves. Because I would have thought, my interpretation of the way it's described in this chapter and the chapter before is mm -hmm. that the cloak is impervious to spells. So the mm -hmm. wearer is impervious to spells when they are wearing the cloak. That's how I right. understood it. But that yep. doesn't seem to actually be the way it is in, in reality. The cloak yep. is impervious to being acted upon. But if you know where the person wearing the cloak is, you can still cast a spell on them. Yep. As long as, as, as wearer, it's not, not to... as the cloak. Right, exactly. Yeah, because the cloak won't show itself or reveal itself. Right, right. Yeah, mm. yeah. I just pulled out Half-Blood Prince and he's wearing the cloak when Dumbledore casts a spell on him. So yeah, I think that's that must be the way to, to, to explain that. Yeah. Cool. What else okay. do you have in this chapter? Um, let's see. Yeah, you know, um, just a sad note. If you did w read this chapter alongside us, it was... It was kind of sad, like to to have to be in Harry's mind and to have him like he's like, okay, so this is how I'm going to survive. I'm going to find the Deathly Hallows. This is what I really have to do. It's what Dumbledore really wanted me to do. The Deathly Hallows are going to save me. And you're like, no, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she lives. You know, it's okay. But it's still kind of like sad. Him. It is just a little sad, like him going through all of it in his mind and figuring it out. Yeah, there's a line, and I didn't mark it, but there's a line where it says, is this what he needed to be safe? Mm -hmm. Like, that's his consideration is like, I'm just trying to stay alive. Yeah. Is this what I have to do to stay alive? Is this how I get to be safe and not have to be on the run all the time? And mm -hmm. the answer, of course, is no, but he doesn't know that yet. And yeah. he chooses not to pursue the Hallows in the end, which we covered right. last week. Which is interesting because Dumbledore is so wise, and I feel like he does a lot of character study because... He had to plan out. He knew he was going to die. So he had to plan things out, hoping that he knew these people well enough to figure out what they would do and try to control the future as much as he can. He knew that Harry would figure out about the Deathly Hallows, and he probably knew that Harry would become obsessed with it. But he also knew that Hermione and Ron would keep them grounded, like especially Hermione. Mm -hmm. And if he knew that Ron was going to leave them, he knew that they would be able to keep Harry from pursuing them too much. I, mm -hmm. I just find all that so fascinating, Dumbledore's plans and how well he knows yeah. people. It is interesting, though, because the one thing he couldn't have known is that Xenophilius would wear the Deathly Hollow symbol to the wedding at the beginning of this book. Mm -hmm. 
He couldn't have known that. And they needed someone to explain the mythology because he gave Hermione the tales of Beetle the Bard in his will, knowing Hermione would not Mm -hmm. believe in it. Right. We believe it was a children's tale. So they would still need another person to explain the mythology. Yeah. To them. Well, they, they saw the, we know we saw that they saw the symbol at, um, in Gogger's hollow, the old grave, um, mm-hmm. Ignatius grave, but yeah, I mean, you're right, but I imagine he probably thought it's Hermione. Like she'll figure it out. She'll find a place to get the information, <laughs> yeah. I guess, you know, like he can't yeah. plan everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he did though. I mean, that was in his, he had to feel like he had given enough pieces that it was an inevitability that Harry would figure it out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there, I suppose there are other people like Batilda Bagshot. Undoubtedly, would have had that knowledge. Just the witch mm. who wrote history history of magic. Yeah, I think she's the one who wrote that one. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's all I had in this chapter. Do you have anything yep. else you you pulled out? Nope. Okay, cool. So let's turn back in time to chapter twenty one, the tale of the three brothers. Yeah, so Ron, Hermione, and Harry are at Xenophilus Lovegood's house waiting on Luna to come back, supposedly. In the meantime, her dad begins telling the tale of the three brothers and the Deathly Hallows. Once finished, they discover that Luna has in fact been captured and is not there, and before the Death Eaters um, that Xenophilus called can capture them, Hermione is able to apparate them out of the house. Hermione, what a hero. Here is the last sentence of the chapter. Hermione twisted in midair and the thundering of the collapsing house rang in Harry's ears as she dragged him once more into darkness. She is so smart. Like in moments time, she thinks first off not to cover Harry, to cover Ron Mm -hmm. so that Ron's family is not um, captured or punished by the Death Eaters. So she covers up Ron instead of Harry, which would be his natural instinct. Ron's like, what are you doing? Don't cover me up, cover Harry up. Mm -hmm. And she waits a second so that the Death Eaters can see Harry so they know Mm -hmm. that Luna's dad wasn't lying. Like, she is Mm -hmm. is just quick on her feet (laughs) to have her mind. Yeah. It's pretty, I know, it's pretty interesting that she's able to remember all those pieces and act in a way that benefits so many people outside who's in the room. Mm Because at the end of the day, if they get captured, it's her own personal safety and her two best friends who are in danger. And she still not only remembers the three of them, but Xenophilius and Luna and the Weasleys mm-hmm. and everyone else and does this in very quick succession, which is probably why, as we were discussing last chapter, Hermione's the only one who's able to come up with a story on the fly when she's being tortured. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? she's able to lie while being tortured, which is hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ron says that. He says, when I got captured by the Snatchers the first time, it was really hard to come up with a story. Yep. And yet Hermione is able to do that because she is that just she's just that brilliant of a witch. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you know, you talking about how she's able to protect others around her, something I actually did notice from the other chapter. And I think we already know this, but it will be kind of fun to watch is Harry and Hermione have very similar hearts. And maybe it's because they're muggle born more, you know, they were raised (laughs) by muggles, but they both often are thinking of other people. You know what I mean? Like Harry was worried about Luna in the last chapter. And so was Hermione, you know, they're, they always arguably Hermione has the softer heart. But they both are very soft hearted where Ron's like, eh. like, he didn't care. He was, he's like, you care if Luna's dad was, was or wasn't captured. He's like, he tried to mm-hmm. like kill us, you know? And they're mm-hmm. like, yeah, we hope he's okay. And Ron's like, forget that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and remember too, I mean, we're moving toward the, the great schism in this group, which is when Ron abandons them. Mm-hmm. Um, we're actually getting there much faster than I thought because yeah. the chapter 20, which is our final chapter today is the first chapter after the silver dough, which is when Ron mm-hmm. returns. So it's like, we're right here where the group is still kind of rebuilding itself and, and mm-hmm. reintegrating. And the whole premise of the fight between Ron and Harry was that Ron was kind of selfish and like, couldn't handle the difficulty of mm-hmm. the, the quest and like living living rough and not having the support of of family or the care from people around them. And Hermione struggled with it. Harry had no problem with it because he had been neglected. So he was able to, so it's like, they are from very different mm. backgrounds. It kind of reveals that in their character, right? Yeah. Also Ron, as you recall from the very first time that Harry meets him, is the youngest boy of six in a family of seven kids. He's always just looking out for himself. 
just trying yeah. to get, and, and, and I will say like my mom is one of many kids and a lot of people you hear from families with many kids, those kids have to just look out for themselves because there are so many kids and so, there's only so many resources. If you are not mm. first and foremost absorbed with yourself, you don't get, <laughs> you just don't get whatever you need. Um, whether that's like enough dinner or like attention from mom and dad or whatever. Harry doesn't have that problem because he never had any of it. And that is in, mm. in its own way sad, but yeah. he does have such a good heart that he overcomes that. And then Hermione has been presumably the only child of doting, loving parents who have supported her. And so she yeah. was raised to be caring like that. And it's just kind of interesting how their different backgrounds may play into that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. That was good. <laughs> yeah. There's my encyclopedic knowledge pulling from all yeah. over. <laughs> yes, yes. I love that. Um, and also it was fun to watch. You know, what's fun is that Ron and Hermione, they're super mad at each other in this chapter and the chapter. They're still very mad at, or excuse well, me, Hermione's Hermione. Mad at Ron. Yes, Hermione is yeah. very mad at Ron. And although I, I now realize how far we are in the book, it's still funny to see them. They didn't seem mad at each other in the chapters we just read. And, you know, at the very last one, basically, you know, they're out there, they're making out. So it's fun to see how far mm -hmm. they've like gone from like her, like literally steaming mad at him, you know, just not even looking at him. And then they're like making out at the end. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And I imagine that Malfoy Manor is a turning point in that, you know, like there are several points mm. in that chapter we covered last week where Ron offers himself up in exchange for Hermione and he is yeah. just totally distraught when she's taken by Bellatrix. And so I think surely Hermione receives that and it, and then she's cared for and supported by Ron when they get to Shell Cottage. So I think, you know, I was yeah. like, is there a point where her feelings about Ron start to shift? And certainly this this chapter and the Deathly Hallows, the one we just covered, mm -hmm. are part of that, right? Because Ron starts always voting with Hermione about where they go. And he's always supportive of her decision, even when it's against what Harry wants to do. And yeah. he takes charge in the group. And like, those are all things that would regain her trust and reconcile him to her. So I think they kind of, they very quickly do move through that. But again, like I said, the, the chapter we just finished, chapter 22, is three months long. It's from wow. Christmas break when they're they're at Christmas break is when they go to see Xenophilius Lovegood. Mm -hmm. And then at one point in the chapter, it says it's March, which by the way, is Ron's birthday month mm -hmm. um, as an aside. So like they don't even celebrate Ron's birthday because they're on the road. Presumably they maybe did something and it's just not in the book, but yeah. three months. And, and in that time, yeah, your anger would subside naturally. You still might not trust the person, but you'd be moving in that direction again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair. That's wild that it was three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I was actually surprised when I read that in chapter 20 that, oh, we'll see Luna because it's Christmas break. And I was like, geez, that was a lot of time <laughs> to be wandering around again, not certain what you're doing. Um, and I see why, you know, Ron would be have been frustrated with that in the first half of the book. Yeah, just walking around, letting time pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, another moment of levity. I love just pointing these out. They're so funny to me. Um, Hermione is, um, I guess, looking at the, or I'm sorry, Xenophilus is telling the story of the, the Deathly Hallows. And um, Harry says, death has an invisibility cloak. <laughs> and Ron says, mm -hmm. so he can sneak up on people. Sometimes he gets bored of running at them, flapping his arms and shrieking. Sorry, Hermione. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he's trying to suck actually, up to Hermione. <laughs> he still is. Interesting point. Um, Hermione is reading this story, and it's obviously in English in the book, but she's uh -huh. reading it in ancient runes because Whoa. that book is all in ancient runes. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the case um, because she has to, or maybe I'm mistaken, because the rune is in the book. We'll double check that. Okay. Don't, don't write in and tell me I'm wrong on that. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's definitely a rune, and I know she has to consult the book her textbook of ancient runes when mm -hmm. she's looking at this story, but I don't remember whether the book itself is actually written in ancient runes. Anyway. Yeah. Hermione's right. reading it and the interjections like death spoke to them. It's a fairy tale. Oh, okay. So again, we don't really know whether death spoke to them or not. Though several thousand years ago, there could have been a wizard just wandering around with some really super powered stuff. And he's able to like do magic like that. He calls himself yeah. death because he's got the elder wand. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I really liked in the telling of the story is the description of the three hollows and what they do. So mm -hmm. the elder wand is a wand that must always win duels for its owner. Mm -hmm. So it cannot lose in a, in a duel, but that's the only context in which it, it has that power. Right. The stone from the riverbank, the stone will have the power to bring back the dead. And that is, that's all it says. It doesn't give any more description. And then finally, um, death 
unwillingly, most unwillingly handed over his own cloak of invisibility. So mm-hmm. whoever made the, the, the cloak was made by somebody. And that person is death in this story, whether or not it's actual death or it's a wizard going with a crazy nickname that got changed in the book. I, I thought that was all really fascinating to have the, the specific constraints of each item described in the original text. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And then they also talk about the handing over of the wand. So we're going to probably go through the Deathly Halls like one at a time. So I have a ton of notes on this section, but um, going to sticking with the Elder Wand, the possessor of the wand must capture it from its previous owner if he is to be true, truly master of it. Have you not heard of the way the wand came to Egbert the Egregious after his slaughter of Emmerich the Evil or how... Uh, Godalot died in his own cellar after his son took the wand from him or dreadful Loxias who took the wand from Barnabas Deverell who he had killed. So Mm -hmm. in some ways I see why Voldemort believes that this is the only way you get to take the wand because the stories throughout history, which I did look up the ownership lineage of the elder wand. It's, Mm -hmm. it's all death. There are no like here, you can have it now. Like (laughs) it's just, I kill you to take it from you, which sounds kind of interesting because it's presumably then the only way you can take the wand is mm-hmm. not in a duel because if you are the master of the elder wand it will win you the duel so you must do something which is not dueling to kill the person that you are taking the wand from right or to master the wand because we know that right. you don't have to or in theory we know you do not have to kill to be the master of the wand in fact right. it is right we do know that to be yeah we know that to be true um right. you don't have to kill but if you do try and kill it can't be in a duel because the wand will always win the duel Um, here, okay, so then jumping around to the cloak, um, Xenophilia says, this is a cloak that really and truly renders the wearer completely invisible and endures eternally, giving constant and impenetrable concealment no matter what spells are cast at it. So I- I'm on the fence. I mean, I can see that in the text, she allows cast spells to be cast under the cloak, basically, like mm-hmm. still get the person underneath. But it doesn't seem like that should be the case from the way she's describing this pre- this item. See, I would disagree because what it says is it's talking, read the last sentence again that you just read. We are talking about a cloak that really and truly renders the wearer completely invisible and endures eternally, giving constant and impenetrable concealment, no matter what spells are cast at it. So concealment. But impenetrable. That means that can penetrate through the, through the cloak. But it's impenetrable concealment. So are we talking about protection of your own body or just that you are never seen you're concealed Mm -hmm. you know what I mean I don't know yeah it's hard I I I definitely (laughs) I definitely agree with people who say that like it must not be the way that I always interpreted it which is that Mm -hmm. nothing can get through the 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 cloak because Mm -hmm. you can get through the cloak we we have evidence of that well and I read somewhere I've now lost it but there was something saying that I think somebody said like well no no cloak is completely um, perfect. So they're saying that there are some flaws and that just must be like one of the flaws that maybe if you know exactly where the person is, you can, you're able to hit them with a spell just because the mm-hmm. tail says that it's impenetrable doesn't mean that it really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Obviously the tail doesn't have all the details because they still have to <laughs> yeah. figure things out about each of them. Right. Um, what did you think of the three, the big three and which of the hollows they each mm-hmm. wanted? So Hermione says the cloak, Ron says the Mm -hmm. wand, and Harry says the stone. I I mean, I think it makes complete sense. Ron obviously would want the wand because all he wants, he always wants to be seen as the best because he is the youngest, because he's constantly fighting for that attention. If he's able to win all these things and be super powerful, he will then be seen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Hermione, obviously, she's been proven, proven with the cloak, that it works. She likes facts. She likes things that are right in front of her. The cloak has done its job so far. Why wish for something else? This cloak's been good to us. And obviously, her, um, Harry would want the Resurrection Stone naturally to be able to converse with all these, just this line of people that have, you know, died tragically in his life. Mm-hmm. What about you? It's almost like the three hollows represent the like three parts of each person, which is like the mind, which is the cloak. So we know that the youngest brother was the wisest and Hermione is the wisest of them. And then the stone is like the heart. um, Mm. And that's Harry because he, all he wants is to be able to be connected with his family. And we also know that that's true because of who he sees in the mirror of Erised. Yeah. And then the ego, um, 
I don't, I don't know that there's a better word than ego, which is the wand. And that's yeah. Ron, who in the Mirror of Era said, sees himself standing up head and shoulders above his brothers and all of his accomplishments. So it's like the three pieces that every person has inside yeah. them. And mm-hmm. everyone has them in a different mix. And they, yeah. in this case, each represent one of the different ones. And yeah, in some that, ways, I love that. The only way you could defeat death or become truly very powerful, I won't say invincible, but very powerful, is if you can conquer those three parts of yourself. Like people who are, I don't know, we're going to get into psychology, but like fully integrated and have, or who are intelligent and smart and intuitive and have a solid education and people who can control their emotions, but also know when to let their emotions help guide them. And then people who believe in themselves, which is what ego really is, mm-hmm. crank up maybe a little too high. When you have all that, those people in the world, like the muggle world, they're unstoppable. We see them. I won't say on Instagram because I think Instagram is a misrepresentation of life, but like you see successful people and you're like, oh, they've like mastered the three pieces of themselves. And that's exactly what these three represent. Dang, Valerie, that was good. (laughs) I know I had some coffee before this episode. Jacob told me, my husband, Jacob, he was like, given that you had COVID and we know brain fog is a thing, you should just have caffeine before every episode. You're going to just be like (laughs) on it. (laughs) You are on one today. I I won't take credit. I won't take credit. It's the coffee. (laughs) still your mind but okay (laughs) swinging entirely one of my favorite moments of levity is when the smell from the kitchen is getting stronger and it smells like burning underpants which (laughs) how do we know what burning underpants smell like and i would like to point out that if burning underpants smell that bad you need to work on your personal hygiene right (laughs) they shouldn't smell that bad and why are you burning them how does harry know that's what that smells like i mean they play quidditch they're in their teens you know hormones sweating (laughs) teenage boys i know that is true that is true oh okay. my gosh what yes. else do you have in this chapter oh i have a good one so i got into the mind of luna obviously this chapter mm-hmm. we get to see like um i believe it's yes you see luna's paint harry goes up to luna's room and she has paintings of her her five friends and there's golden chains linking all of them and on each little chain it has friends written over and over and over again and in the living room it's like or the kitchen it's brightly colored and harry says almost too much too much brightness you know which is very luna um, but what I liked is I, um, I don't know how I got on this. I'm not sure which word I wish I could remember now, but so according to, a uh, Harry Potter wiki, Luna Lovegood becomes a wizarding naturalist, which is a Maggie zoologist. So it means she, um, it was her favorite class would have been Hagrid's class, which is mm-hmm. a care of magical creatures because she mm-hmm. actually becomes a wizarding naturalist who searched the globe for impossible creatures, such as the, um, you might have to help Snorak. me out. Yes. Well, the, yes, the crumple horn Snorak. So she searches the whole world trying to find it because she believes that it did exist. So she's like Newt Scamander. Cause that's what yes. he is too. Yeah. That's cool. That is very yeah. cool. Oh, I, I don't know that I would ever have guessed that that's her favorite class, but it obviously makes sense. Right. I yeah. think she would have liked herbology too, because she does like unusual plants mm-hmm. and things like that. And then that she loves animals. Very cool. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, well done. Well researched. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. What else did you find? Um, That's all I had actually in this chapter. Okay. I had a lot of notes uh, on this one. This a lot more than yeah. the last chapter we're going to cover. I don't think we fully covered it. So I just want to throw it back. Cause I just think it's a cool thing for us to hear, especially in our world right now. Um, you mentioned it a little bit, but um, so whenever they are reading, whenever Hermione is reading about the Deathly Hallows, basically um, Zeno, Xenophilus, Xenophilus. I, I literally Googled that. So I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> I was like, how do I pronounce his name? So it's spelled <laughs> like X E N O. Um mm-hmm. But that's, Hermione says, well, that's, I'm sorry. That's completely ridiculous. Ridiculous. How can I possibly prove it does, uh, doesn't exist? And he said, I mean, you could claim that anything's real is the only basis for believing in it is that nobody's proven it doesn't exist. Yes, you could, says Xenophilus. I am glad to see that you're opening your mind a little. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think that's the one. The only way you can claim is that it, it exists. So basically, it's like, open your mind. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not real. So now mm-hmm. another one of those little notes that uh, Rowling likes to leave for us, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that's a, that's a very interesting little tidbit because obviously with Xenophilius and Luna, they take it to an extreme Mm -hmm. in that they believe things which have basically no evidence and against, against evidence to the contrary, right? Like the idea is 
you can believe in something until you prove it, until you can get enough evidence to prove one way or the other. And actually, a lot of people think about science the wrong way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we live in a world where science is kind of under fire for the last few years. Mm -hmm. Science does not say things exist. It simply says there is a lot of evidence that says this is probably the way things are. But if enough evidence comes in another direction, we will shift the way that science thinks about this idea. Yeah. And um, I think the danger is if you if you take Xenophilius's advice to the extreme of like, just because you can't prove it's true, you can't prove it's not true doesn't mean means it is true. Sorry, let me say that again. Just because you can't prove it's untrue doesn't mean it's not true. Right. That's where conspiracy theories come from. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. like that's the danger. Like is that you do if you do believe that exclusively and you don't fact check against like there there's these specific etchings on and markings on the outside of this horn that that basically we know that whenever you see that that means it's an erumpent, not a crumple horn yeah. snorkack. That means it's probably not a crumple horn snorkack and if you keep believing that it is a not dangerous item when it's likely a dangerous item, you put yourself at risk. And, and he did. that's sort of a blew up the house. Exactly. It's like you can <laughs> You can, you should certainly be open-minded to the idea that just because you've never seen it doesn't mean it's not real, but also yeah. like, don't just believe that things are real just because they've never been seen or not seen. Cause then yeah. you risk believing in things which are, are patently un, untrue in, in false or in positive, right? Like, mm -hmm. Impossible. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, I, I did like that him kind of challenging her. I'm glad you're opening your mind a little bit. Yeah. Because <laughs> she is close-minded about this. And I think she gives him a bad look, but Harry starts to talk. He's like, and anyways. <laughs> so Hermione <laughs> doesn't have any uh, thing to say against that. But uh, the only yeah. other thing I yeah. found this chapter really quickly was she keeps throwing Easter eggs in there. Uh, the Rowena, the Ravenclaw headdress. So you have mm -hmm. the headdress. Uh, it's just kind of funny that it's there because eventually it ends up being a horcrux we don't know that yet but and he even offered it he said here here's this thing i'm making he offers it to the death eaters it's again mm -hmm. a clue and you mm -hmm. know, they don't take it yeah it's it is interesting because when harry remembers that he's seen the diadem before he he, he remembers two ugly busts mm -hmm. one is the one where he's seen the actual diadem in the room of requirement and the other one is the this one that xenophilius has made and yeah. so without those two pieces of evidence, he might not have realized that it was an object that important in the magical world that, of course, Voldemort would have wanted it and would have used it to make it a horcrux. Yep. Cool. Cool. Okay. So let's turn back one more chapter. And we're in chapter 20, which is called Xenophilius Lovegood. Yeah. In this chapter, it appears that Ron has just returned to camp from previously deserting them. Hermione is still not speaking to Ron and decides that they need to go see Luna Lovegood's dad to learn more about the symbol that he was wearing as a necklace that was on the old grave at Godric's Hollow and Dumbledore's signature to Grindelwald. The chapter ends with Xenophilus telling them about the Deathly Hallows. Mm -hmm. And the last sentence is, are you referring to the sign of the Deathly Hallows? So mm -hmm. this chapter is very feels very transitory, moving through, yeah. giving us a lot of information, and I don't have very many notes in that. So while we are running a little bit long in this episode, we're probably going to go through this chapter pretty quickly. Yep. And so what do you have? What notes do you have? Um, yeah, you know, the only thing I have, I think these all kind of blended together for me. So a lot of the notes I had on this, I've already talked about. But the main thing I found interesting was here's where we start to learn about um, the life and lies of Albus Dumbledore. And... Rita Skeeter, which Rita Skeeter wrote. And you can see that because Ron starts to talk to Harry about this and about how Dumbledore, he's like, Dumbledore was young, like give him some, give him some slack. Like this may be true, but he was young. And Harry's like, we're young. We're the same age. That gives him no excuse. And you can see it's a sore spot for Harry. And I, I realize we now know he does have that three months to kind of simmer on it, but it's so funny how, and maybe just how death is humbling. <laughs> But once Harry sees Dumbledore um, at King's Cross in the chapter of King's Cross, th there's none of that left for him. He has mm -hmm. already forgiven Dumbledore. And um, yeah, it was interesting to see those other emotions from Harry that he really was disappointed and upset to hear that Dumbledore maybe wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really look forward again now that we've covered the tale of the three brothers to getting into the chapter of the life and lives of Albus Dumbledore where we learn about Grindelwald because that's the next big piece of mm -hmm. backfilling a story that we need to make sense of these characters we've been following or will be following as we move backwards through the books. Uh, yeah, I think that that I, I'm, I'm like Harry, like I think young people... Well, I certainly understand that that young people's decision making is not at the level of adults, right? We just know that our brains develop until mm -hmm. we're like in our mid 20s. I think that young people can and should be held to certain standards of ethical behavior. And we we need to teach them that. And, and part of that, right, if we think about it in the context of this story is Dumbledore has lost both his parents. 
Yeah. So in some ways, he doesn't have good guides. And we know that the guides he had, his two parents, are not necessarily the best guides because his father attacks muggles because of uh, the thing, whatever attack they did upon Ariana. And his mm-hmm. mother live, leaves this life of secrecy and, and you know, not, not being forthright and open about um, owning who you are and what your family is and, and supporting each person, right? So we can find historical evidence in Dumbledore's backstory for the reasons that he's like this, but also Harry didn't have parents, didn't have good guides in that way, and still was Mm -hmm. able to see that there was something that was very wrong about the idea of taking a stand for the greater good or pursuing the Deathly Hallows. Though he's also tempted by them once he knows what they are. So in that way, he maybe, (laughs) maybe that's what that three months gives him is a chance to realize that the Deathly Hallows can poison your mind because they do for him in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Did you notice anything else? I did, but my things are really small. So I just wanted to point out, we did talk last time about uh, Patronuses and that this is the verification again, that Kingsley's Patronus is a lynx, just like yours. Yeah. <laughs> That's a reminder yeah, that. of the quiz, which we'll come uh-huh. back to right at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I had, it's really quick. And then whatever you have to wrap us up yeah. is the, the two weeks ago, Xenophilius bought a, a and a, a rumpin and a crumplehorn snorkack from a delightful young wizard who knew of my interest in the exquisite Snorkak. Who is this wizard? This feels a lot <laughs> like when Hagrid goes to the Hogshead and meets a stranger and buys a dragon egg or like, you know, like that whole dynamic. Like who knows that Cinephilius wants a Crumplehorn Snorkak horn and sells him in a rumpet horn, which is hard to get illegal. You know, like who does that? Who is this wizard? I just want to know. Maybe I'll have to do some research. Yeah, and maybe it's related to the Fantastic Beasts movies. I mean, it's very possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you should do that research because now I want to know. <laughs> yeah, like he, he basically sold him a dangerous good knowing that he didn't know what it was, which is right. in itself a suggestion that it's someone who's not acting in his best interest. Right, or he's just someone who smuggles things and just wants money and is trying to take advantage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Seems like a little a little thread that I want to pull on. So Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, I think I talked about it a little before, but I just find it all interesting to think about what Luna's life was like. Um, There was a note where they said they saw Xenophilus and they're like, wow, he looked really awful. And they're like, wow, well, compared to this, he looked dapper at the wedding, you know? And Mm -hmm. you saw he kind of had a flashback of Luna and him dancing and having a good time and how Luna's like the light of his life. And you get to see their house this whole past three chapters. And um, yeah, just kind of the making of Luna, you know, you know that her mom died young and you know she has this dad who obviously will do anything to protect her and there he he runs the quip he runs the quibbler and he believes in magic. <laughs> obviously there's magic, but there's he believes in magic beyond magic and he believes in mm-hmm. the unknown and just everything that makes up Luna. To then of course we now know that she became a wizarding naturalist who loves beasts and it just has the kindest heart and I don't know I just find it all very interesting obviously she's my favorite character so maybe that's why I find it interesting but it is um it does give you a little more time moving backwards to kind of actually focus on these details of the house and details of her life and just kind of think about it and the awful Mm -hmm. food she ate (laughs) yeah (laughs) burning underpants uh (laughs) yeah I think uh I think JK Rowling does a nice job of fleshing out the backstory of the secondary and tertiary characters like we do learn a lot more about many of these other characters that don't necessarily seem important to the plot and in some ways aren't important to the plot other as just bodies in the room moving the story forward like we learn Neville's backstory we learn Luna's backstory we learn about Seamus and his mom we see them a couple a couple different times um we learn about Dean and his family being worried about him that all makes the whole thing much more uh like believable as a universe is that everyone does have a backstory and we learn some of those pieces as we go through and it becomes relevant for us to know them and it makes reading the books this way much more interesting because we're picking up those pieces of these other characters and realizing how it helped make Harry, Ron and Hermione understand the people that they had aligned themselves with in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. She does a very, very good job at that. Um, Mm -hmm. Makes it very rich, very rich story. (laughs) Yep. Do you have anything else in this chapter? No. You? Okay. 
No, I don't. I don't. I, like I said, this this last chapter, I had very few notes. In fact, most of the notes that I had, we'd already covered. So when I know. we switched into this chapter, I started pulling them all back out of my book. So what we want to do before we wrap things up, and uh, again, thanks for sticking with us on a little bit longer episode, is we have to do our Gilderoy Lockhart style quiz. Yeah. So as a reminder, if this is your first episode, every single episode in the season, which is the Deathly Hollow season, we are answering questions about ourselves because we're doing it Gilderoy Lockhart style. And at the end of the season, we will do a quiz where the person who gets the right, the most right answers will win a prize, just like Hermione did with Gilderoy Lockhart. So this week, the question that we are answering is, what is your favorite film from the Harry Potter series? You go first. Okay. I do know this answer. And I actually had someone ask me a question about this on my blog. And I love okay. giving this answer. So for okay. me, it is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part one. Okay. And the reason that it's my favorite is because it is the most loyal to the books. It is Mm. absolutely like whole sections of the book are lifted up out of the text and put on the screen and the dialogue is the same and the imagery is exactly the same. And I love that commitment to bringing the vision on the page to life because one and two were good and then they kind of got creative and that's fine. It's film. It's its own medium. You You can bring a story to life in the way that you see it. But I believe that at the end of the day, if a text can be brought to life on the screen, it should be brought the way it was originally intended. And Deathly Hollows Part 1 is the best one of doing that. Nice. Yeah. 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 You know, it was really good. I feel like, because I, although I didn't start till later, I still believe I started at like movie five, whenever they started coming out. And it gets really good. You know what I mean? Like movie six, movie seven, movie eight, you know, the the characters that the stars, excuse me, they've all grown up. They're, they're doing much. They're, they were always incredible. Don't take me wrong, but they've grown up. They're, they're moving into these really dark movies and they're owning their characters. And it is just, Mm -hmm. it's very, very good and very different, obviously from the first, you know, four movies even, or first three for sure. Um, which we know from, if you watch the reunion, you see like the different directors in the movies, the, the, the way that they took the movies, but, uh, regardless, yes, uh, that is, uh, A very, very good one. You know, I have a hard time choosing favorites in general. You know, I think my most watched movie is um, number three. My niece, for the longest time, was only able to read up to book six and then, or book three, excuse me, and then watch up to movie three as well. And so The Prisoner of Azkaban, um, that is not my favorite. It actually drove me crazy for a little while because that's all we could watch. And now I just like have grown Mm -hmm. to love it because I almost know it like word by word because we watched it Mm -hmm. so much. Um, Yeah, I think mine is the same as the book. It's Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I I love that one. Stuff starts to happen. You really, Harry's story gets even more richer. He gets to grow up a little. All the characters have grown up, I think, a lot in this one. It's after Sirius dies. You have Dumbledore dying, which is very sad. But then at the same time, Harry gets to know him more. I just, yeah, I don't, I really like this one. Yeah, good choice. A lot of people, yeah. I think a lot of people, their book and their movie are the same. And it's yeah. funny because I, I am, I love movies. It's another area of, of, my life that I just love talking about. And I sort of think about it differently. The other thing I will say is like, not only is my favorite movie and my favorite book different, I don't believe that either of those two, Deathly Hallows or Half-Blood Prince is the most important story in the entire series. So Mm -hmm. for me, Prisoner of Azkaban, if you were to point to the most important book in terms of the information and characters given, Prisoner of Azkaban is where the whole universe starts to open up to us. And so I always point like, it's where we meet Mooney Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. It's where we learn about yep. time travel. It's where we get a bunch of backstory information about potentially the uh, the prophecy and what's important to Harry, even though it's not explicitly addressed in that book in the same way. So it's, it's really interesting because I'm like, I actually, if you're like, what's the most important? It's definitely Prisoner of Azkaban. And which one do I like in reading? It's Half-Blood Prince. And which one do I like watching? It's Deathly Hallows Part 1. And I people always want to know why they're so different in the answers. And mm-hmm. it's because I, I, I view them all very differently. But yeah, okay, so no, one hundred percent. I agree. Mm-hmm. Like book one, definitely the most enjoyable. I think like it is, it's just exciting because Harry gets to become a wizard and you learn about this cool universe. Like, yeah, all of them have different things going for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's well, wrap it up. Yep. This was a long episode. Um, some of them will Sorry, be longer, guys. of course, because we cover more in them. And there was obviously a ton we needed to cover in this episode because it had the Deathly Hallows finally being explained. Um, but As we wrap it up, we want to just say thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us in the Wizarding World today. If you have enjoyed what you've listened to, we would really appreciate a five-star rating and a review. Uh, The reviews Mm -hmm. are actually 
equally important to the ratings because that is the signal that someone is truly invested and listened to the podcast. So we could just ask you to give five-star reviews after the first three minutes of the episode, but that's not as important to us as actually getting your feedback and learning if we are making mistakes in our understanding or we're not saying the right thing. Uh, we want to hear all that feedback. You can also find us on social media. Yep. Uh, Bell Jar Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok and email. Yep. You can reach us by email as well at podcast at follow the butterflies.com. Uh, follow the butterflies.com is my Harry Potter blog. So if you are just dying for more Harry Potter, you can find lots of other information there, mm -hmm. uh, how to decorate your kitchen and uh, how to make a moaning myrtle costume and all kinds of different topics that might be of interest to you. So, yep, you can email us there. There's a page on the site with that information. You can find us on social at Bell Jar Pod. And you can always just leave us a review and we will get back to you. We will, we can kind of keep an eye on things and call things out and we will be back next week with even more of the wizarding world. Yeah. Thanks for being here. See you next time. <laughs>